Thanks for listening to our online messages from Calvary Chapel North Shore on the island of Kauai. Stay up to date on content and our events on our website, calvarychapelnorthshore.com and on Instagram at CCNS Kauai. If you'd like to donate to our ministry, you can do so on our website. Now let's dive into the Word. We are in Hebrews chapter 2. We got as far as verse 4 last week. We're going to finish uh, the chapter today. A lot of good stuff in Hebrews. Um, I don't know. If, do you guys like Hebrews? Yeah. I like it. You know, it's proof that man's the one that makes the coffee because it says Hebrews. <laughs> I had to get that in once, right? All right. Settle down. Okay, Hebrews chapter 2. Let's read uh, verses 5 through 9. It says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subject in the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou put him all, put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that was not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We praise your holy name, Lord God, and we ask right now that you would just open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit's going to say to us today, Lord God. Lord, would you jumpstart our hearts to be just strengthened and wanting to serve you and to love you and to love others, Lord, because you're worth it. Lord, help us. We, need, we came here for strength today. So pour out your spirit, move in this place. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Well, I entitled the message... Who are we? Who are we? When you stop and you think about God, creator of all things, and you stop and you think about how massive the universe is, it's really mind-blowing to think that the one that made all of that would care about you and me. So who are we? As the psalmist asked there in verse 6, what is man? What, what is man that thou is mindful of him? When you have so much power, so much authority, so much love, I mean, to think that God cares about you, to think that God loves you so much He can't take His eyes off you. That blows my mind. When you look at the vastness of this universe, the complexity of creation, and to think that He loves us with an unconditional love, He is the, the famous one. He is the ultimate. He's everything. You know, I, I, you ever meet someone famous? And Anybody met anybody famous on this island? Let me see your hands. Show me how many of you have met some, a lot of you. You know why? Because everybody in the world wants to come to Kauai. Right? They spend thousands of dollars to come here. We live here. And they come, and they come, and they like Kauai because, because people don't really bug them, the famous people. They'll say hi, but they won't, like, throng them. They won't go after them. You know, they, they give them respect, some room. But I'll tell you what, here's what's interesting that I found over the years. Well, I've seen so many actors and actresses and musicians and stars and politicians, presidents, people that are officials, senators and stuff, coming to this island and been able to meet them, and, and, I, and I know a lot of you have seen that too, and here's the amazing thing, is that uh, when you meet someone famous, what do you do? Oh, you have to think about that? You tell everybody you can. You tell everybody, you try to get a selfie with them, right? You, you show, man, I was hanging out with so-and-so, you know, they're really down to earth. You know, you act like you know them, you met them like 30 seconds, and you, you really can make an assessment of what kind of person they are, right? But you go and you tell everybody. You're telling your friends, you're telling your family, I met so-and-so today, oh, it was so cool, man, I can't believe it, you know? And we've all done that. But I'll tell you what, I met a famous person here on Kauai once, and it was 1987 at Honolulu Bay, I met Jesus Christ.
And I'll tell you what, I was so excited, I told everybody, and I'm still a Jesus freak. I still love, I love, I love to talk about Jesus more than anything else. I love to share Jesus with people. I like to go around and go, you know who I met? I met Jesus. And you know what? I want to introduce you to him. And, and we want to share that because he is truly the famous one. And when you stop and you think about the most important person in your life, Jesus Christ, your Lord, your Savior, he's worthy to be praised and he's worthy to be having his name shared with everybody you can. Amen. And so this is an exciting thing when you stop and think about what the psalmist is saying is, is that who is man that God is mindful of us? You know, when we started this chapter, just a quick little review, he said uh, there in verse one that therefore we ought to give more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should slip or drift away. For the word spoken by angels was steadfast. Every transgression and disobedience received its just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which is the first begin to be spoken of by the Lord, then was confirmed to us by them that heard him, the apostles, God also bearing witness, both with signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. Very powerful verses that we looked at last week, spent the whole sermon on that. And the importance of the writer to Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, encouraging the Hebrew Christians not to drift away. What was happening to them? How were they drifting away? They were drifting away because they had tasted and experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, salvation by faith, but then they started getting drawn back into faith plus works. Faith plus works doesn't work. It's faith plus nothing that saves you. You can't add anything. You can't bring anything to the table. You can't pay for salvation. You can't earn it. You've got to accept it. It's a free gift of God. He did it all on the cross. Your works are a reflection of your love for him. But what happened is they were drifting away. They were getting pulled back into animal sacrifice, which is a slap in the face to Jesus. I love Jesus, but I'm sacrificing animals. Stop that. It's over. He's the final sacrifice once and for all. No more sacrifices needed. He finished it. So as a Christian to go back under the law, under circumcision, under dietary laws, back to sacrificial system was a slap in the face to God. And the writer to the Hebrews says, turn away from that. Don't, don't drift into that. But how can we drift as Christians? Well, we can drift as Christians when, when we start getting caught up in legalism. You ever been caught up in legalism? I have. You know, you start doing some things for the Lord. Next thing you know, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty awesome. Man, how come you aren't doing what I'm doing? That's legalism. When we start looking down at people because they're not reading their Bible as much as we do, or they're not serving in the church like we do, or, or they're not giving to the Lord like we give to the Lord, or, or whatever it may be, when you start looking like that, that's legalism. And you know what's going to happen to you? When you get to heaven, you stand at the beam of seat of Christ, all your works will be burned up because you did it for the wrong reason. If you're serving God and giving to God and loving on people because you love Jesus, then you got the right heart. You don't need any pats on the back. You don't need applause of men. You don't need to go around and tell somebody else that they're not measuring up to your standards because you know what? It's between you and the Lord. You're responsible for you. You're in a race. Run your race and finish well. Now, here's the good news. You're not running against anybody else. You're only running against yourself, so I think you can pull it off. You're going to win. He's going to get you across the, the finish line. And then he tells us that these words were spoken by angels. So if the angels came with a sure word, how much more should we listen to the words of Jesus? He says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How are you going to escape if you somehow are going to now change the rules and say it's faith in something else? If you hear anybody say you're saved by faith and as soon as you hear the and, you say, no, nope, stop, not going to accept that. You're adding to the gospel. It's saved by faith period. And I'm pretty stoked about that because you know why? Because it was saved by works. You know, every religion out there outside of Christianity is works driven. And you know what the problem with that is? Nobody's ever sure if they've done enough. But I tell you what, even though we're saved by faith, we should have some evidence of our saving faith because words without deeds are empty and worthless. 
Your good deeds are evidence of your faith. And then we see there when he says this, uh, God, he says, he says, the Lord has confirmed unto us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness with signs, wonders, and diverse miracles and the gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will, that when you give your life to Jesus Christ, you not only become born again, but you are empowered by the Holy Spirit and you're given gifts of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome? And the gifts are free. Freely given, freely give. <laughs> <laughs> no, freely receive, you're right, but freely given, freely, man, I'll give you one more shot at that. Freely given, freely, okay, thank you. You guys are listening. I love it. Okay, so here's the deal. So we freely receive the gifts, as my brother said, but they're not for you. It's for everyone else. And when you use that gift, you know what happens? God fills you afresh. You use the gift, you empty out, and then you say, Lord, fill me afresh because I'm kind of empty. And he's going to give you the power and the strength to do everything because you don't want to do ministry in your own power. You want, he offers his own power. Tap into it. Pray for a fresh filling. I pray for a fresh filling all day long. I probably prayed for a fresh filling, I would say maybe 50 times already this morning. Because I don't want to get up here without Jesus. I want to be filled afresh. I want you guys to be filled afresh. I want God to be working in you and through you and blessing others through the gifts that he gives you. Now, he gives you the gifts, and it says there in verse 4, according to his will. Why is that important? It's not according to your will. It's not according to your will. There's a lot of people out there that are pushing, like, you know, you can have any gifts of the Spirit, name it and claim it. I, I don't see that in the Scriptures. I don't see anywhere it says that you can have any gift that you want. I don't see that. And I, I, over the years, I've seen like, you know, speaking in tongues seminars. You know, you come to our seminar and, and, and speak. In, you know, you, the gifts are given without repentance by the Lord. I can't teach you how to do a gift. So don't go to a speaking seminar on how to speak in tongues because they're going to come in. You're, you're going to pay money. You're going to come in. They're saying, we can teach you how to speak in tongues. And they get everybody together and they go, okay, ready? Everybody all at once. Should about a Hyundai. Should about a Hyundai. Should about a Hyundai. Should about a Hyundai. What do you think about it? How do you feel now? I feel like I should about a Hyundai. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in the gift of tongues. But I'm, my point I'm trying to make is that I can't teach you tongues. It's a gift given by God. And maybe you've prayed for that gift and maybe you've never gotten that gift. But maybe that's because God says you can worship him really good in English. OK, because the gift of tongues is a, it's, it's a language. It's a heavenly language and it's all about praising God. And that's it. It's between you and God, and that's the whole thing. You know, when I see these, um, these groups having these signs and wonders conferences, you know, it, they get so focused on miracles and signs and wonders, and then they try to make something happen. And if, if the Holy Spirit's not moving, they will make something happen. And then they'll try to use the Word of God to confirm what they just did. What I see throughout the whole Bible in the book of Acts is when the Word of God is taught, then God confirms the word that was taught with signs and wonders. That's what I see. You, this whole idea that you can name it and claim it and have any of the gifts of the Spirit, you come to our conference, you pay $100, we give you a notebook, and then we'll all shake. And I, I don't see it. God gives the gifts. Now, I know you guys have gifts. Now, here's the sad thing. If you have a gift and you're not using it for the glory of God, your gift that you have is to use here in this fellowship. God has put you here for such a time as this. Use your gift or you're hindering the body of Christ. You can imagine if every Christian was using their gift, how things would be. It would be an amazing, amazing thing. And then we come to verse 5 where the psalmist, uh, well, not the psalmist, but uh, he makes this important statement here, verse 5. And this is really important. Take, this, take notes on this. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Okay? What is he saying there? He's, he's saying, which of the angels are going to be in charge of the world? And the answer is, none. He did not put angels in charge of the world, and he is not going to put angels in charge of the kingdom to come, the thousand-year millennial kingdom reign. 
This is a very important verse because you're going to deal with your Jehovah Witness friends and your Mormons friends who are going to say that Jesus is an angel, a created being. Jesus is not an angel. Jesus is not a created being. He is the creator who created the angels. And right here, he says no angels are going to be in charge of the world. That's good news. And then he goes on, and speaking of the world, he quotes from Psalm 8, King David, the psalmist, says this, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? You know, you can just picture David one day as he was tending the sheep, and nighttime came, and he was looking up in the sky, and he was looking at all the stars. You know, like, you know those nights that you come out, it's been really clear lately, and you go outside at night, and it's just like the, the sky is just peppered with stars all over the sky, and it's amazing, and it's beautiful, and it's mind-blowing because the stars that we're looking at are so far away, it's insane. Matter of fact, you know, light travels at 186,000 miles per second. Actually, 186,282 miles per second. Light travels, speed of light. And when you look at the closest star to you and you see that reflection, that is light that you are seeing was sent back when Abraham and Sarah were walking the earth. That's how long it takes light to get to us from the closest star to us traveling at 186,282 miles per hour. Is that crazy? So here's David looking up at this vast universe that God created and somehow by the Holy Spirit getting insight on how intense it is. And he just goes, wow, what is man? Do you even care about us? <laughs> that you're mindful of us. Now, when we look into outer space, Scientists don't deal with miles, they deal with light years, light years, and light traveling at 186,000 miles per second, transfer that over to light years, that's a lot of travel, that's a lot of distance covered, it's crazy to think about, when we think about our Milky Way galaxy. Our Milky Way galaxy is so big that it's a hundred thousand light years across. What does that mean? That means if you're traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and you traveled for a hundred thousand years, you would make it across the Milky Way. It would take you 100,000 years to cross our Milky Way where our solar system is. Now that's crazy because the Milky Way is just a speck in our universe. When I was a kid, they said there was millions of galaxies. When I grew up, they said there was billions of galaxies. And now they're talking trillions. The universe is so huge. And when you stop and you think that our galaxy is a speck in the universe and our solar system is a speck in our galaxy and our earth is a speck in our solar system and you're just a speck on the earth you got to think god is pretty spectacular But let's go out far beyond our solar system, which is 100,000 light years across, and let's come to a place that's 440 light years past our galaxy, and it's called the Pleiades. The Pleiades. The Pleiades are mentioned in Job 9 and in Job 38. Matter of fact, in Job 38, 31, God said to Job, Can, thou, can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of, of Orion? That was over 4,000 years ago. Do you know what? In 1610, Galileo discovered the Pleiades. Galileo discovered Orion in 1610. But if you went back to Job, the oldest book in the Bible over 4,000 years ago, God already called it out. Hello? Science, wake up. You called it something that God already put a name to it. 
Go figure. It's amazing. Amazing stuff. But I want to take you out a little bit farther. I want to take you out 28 million light years beyond our galaxy to the Sombrero, Sombrero Galaxy. Do we got that? You guys see that? I mean, isn't that amazing? It looks like a little hat, but I mean, it's just packed with all kinds of like stuff in there. And I mean, it's just mind blowing. And that's that's 28 million light years out there. Now I'm going to take you even farther. I'm going to take you out to uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy, which is 31 million light years away from our galaxy. And I don't know, I don't have the best picture, but just to give, give you an idea, it's called the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's turning, but if you can see the little pink areas, those little pink areas are where the Whirlpool Galaxy is birthing stars. The universe is growing. This, this galaxy is birthing. God says in his word, he knows the stars and he knows them by name. And he's still making them. Isn't that mind-blowing? But I, I want to take you out even farther than that. I want to take you to something that's so crazy, so far out there, it's going to blow your mind. And it even blew the mind of the scientists when they first saw it. They pointed the telescope into the center of the Whirlpool galaxy, and this is what they got. Yeah. A cross. Yeah. yeah, you can, you know. Yeah. It's for it. And you know what's interesting? If you go the other way into a microscope and you come into the molecules and the cells and the human body and then in the organs, you'll find a laminin. And a laminin is in the shape of, guess what? A cross. Cross before me, cross behind me. I'll tell you what. The psalmist said, What is man that thou art mindful, or the son of man that you visited him? What is man that you are mindful of him? I tell you what, we need to upsize our worship for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? In verse 6, I want to read that through 9 to kind of get the feel. David saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor, and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that was not put under him. But now we see not all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Just remember that. When everything looks tragic, but God. You know, I, I talk with someone in this church all the time, Myrna, and we talk about, we talk about like the crazy stuff that's going on and stuff that people are going through and just the nuttiness of what's going on, on the island and everything. And we always ended up with, but God. But Jesus, God's large and in charge. Nothing's too big for him to handle. I don't care how crazy it's going on in your life, but God, but Jesus. We see Jesus. He makes this statement, the psalmist, that God created everything, and everything that God created on this earth, he put in subjection to man. When Adam was created, Adam had all authority over all the things on the earth and all the creation on earth. God gave him that authority. And it talks about there was nothing that was made that wasn't put under him. But then in that, that, that one verse that we see is that it says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. Why? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. Adam fell in the garden and forfeited it all. When Adam sinned in the garden... He gave the authority away, and Satan snatched it up. He deceived. He was deceived by Satan. Eve was deceived. Actually, Adam knew what he was doing and fell, and they handed off the torch, the title deed of the world, to Satan. Satan is the prince of this world, but Jesus has paid for the, the world. He's bought it back with his blood, and he's going to come take it back soon as he comes for his church, and he comes as in his second coming and sets up his kingdom. So we see that the first Adam blew it, but the last Adam shows us how things should have been. Did you know um, that's how the Bible refers to Adam and Jesus, the first Adam and the last Adam? Because the first Adam blew it, and the last Adam saved us by what he did at the cross. Now here's the interesting thing. Did you ever think about this? Jesus was without sin. Amen? Did you know Adam was created without sin? 
the only man to be created without sin. But when him and Eve fell in the garden, what happened? We were born into sin. Why? Because we all came from Adam and Eve. We're all descendants from Adam and Eve. You don't have to go on genealogy.com and pay all this money to find out who your ancestors are. You can come give me 300 bucks and I'll tell you it was Adam. <laughs> so what we see that the first Adam blew it, we can see how it should have been when we look at Jesus in his ministry. Why? Because Jesus shows us how it should have been because when Jesus rebuked the wind, the wind stopped. When Jesus rebuked the sea and said, sea be still, the, 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 the water went glassy. When he was in Matthew 4, the 40 days of being tempted and fasting, uh, it says that the animals lied down around him. That's how it should have been. If you want to see how the earth was supposed to be, look at Jesus. It's a picture of man living in harmony with the Father and having the authority over nature. We don't always think about that with Adam, that Adam had authority over nature. Adam could control nature when he was first in the garden and him and Eve were first together before the fall. They could control the weather. They could control nature, the, the trees, the flowers. I think there was communication going on. Like, you know, when you watch that kid's show Narnia, there's probably a lot of truth in that. And, and I think they were communicating with the animals. You know why I say that? Because when the serpent came to talk to Eve, it wasn't like she was blown away that this creature was talking to her. And I think they had that communication. But when the fall took place and they sinned and they fell against God, all that was taken away. Not only was humanity rocked, but all of nature was rocked. And now all of nature cries out, waiting for the coming of the Lord. So in verse 9, he says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. This is a powerful, powerful verse. What does that mean? But, but that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. You want the short answer? He came to save us. He had to do this. He had to come as a man and die. But he had to come as God to provide the perfect sacrifice. He was fully man, fully God. But God cannot die. So he had to come clothed in flesh so that he could die in the image of a man, we were made in God's image, so he came clothed in flesh as a man. He could die for our sins. And it's this unity of those two things that allows God to be not only the just, but to be the justifier of sinful man. It is the only way in the universe by which man can be saved. How do I know that? Well, I know because when I looked in the garden, when Jesus went to the garden before they took him, the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed to the Father. He said, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Why did Jesus say that? Because Jesus was starting to feel for the very first time the separation between him and the Father. Throughout all eternity, they had never been separate. They were one. They thought the same way. They loved. They were in each other. The, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, three in one. And all had been together. But what happened at the cross is the Father had to turn his back on sin. And Jesus was going to feel the separation from the Father for the first time. And that was horrific. He never experienced that, but he did it for you because he loves you so much. He paid for your sin on the cross to die for your sin so that you could have eternal life. And that means that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Does that mean the whole world's going to be saved? No. God's love doesn't save you. You have to respond to God's love. What that means is that every man is now savable. Every man, every woman is savable. they got to respond to the love of God. It's an amazing, amazing thing to think about what God did for us. See, in the garden, as he started to feel that separation, he said, Father, 
Here's what he was saying in a nutshell. If there's any other way that man can be saved, let this cup pass, but not my will, but thy will be done. He became our cup bearer because the cup he drank of spared our lives by asking Jesus into our hearts. He paid the price. You know, in the old days, with the kings, they had cupbearers. You ever heard of that, the cupbearers? The cupbearer's job was to, was to drink the wine before the king did because there might be poison in it, and the cupbearer had a really close relationship with the king, and, and if there was any poison in the, in the wine, he would die and the king would be okay. And he would eat from the plate that the king was going to eat, so if there was any poison, he would die, and, and the king would know not to trust the chef. Pretty tough job to be a cupbearer. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. Jesus Christ was our cupbearer to drink of a cup full of the poison of sin for our sakes that we might receive Him as Lord and Savior and become the righteousness of God. He did all that for you because He loves you. You were created in the image of God. Jesus came and died for man. He didn't come to die for angels. You were not made in the image of angels. You were made in the image of God. And where it says he came down, he was made a little lower. He wasn't made, he wasn't created, but his impress into the world, born of a virgin in Bethlehem, he came in as fully God, fully man. For the purpose, he had to be man for the purpose of dying because he couldn't die as God. And when I think about him coming to this world clothed in flesh, I don't think about how cool that is that he came here, but I think about how wild it is what he left. I mean, think about what Jesus left to come here. To be a speck on this earth, which is a speck in our solar system, which is a speck in our galaxy, which is a speck in the universe. To think that he left all the glory of God for you and me. That is mind-blowing. To have people spit on him and reject him and crucify him, beat him. And he died for them too? Wow. In verse 10 it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sacrifice. How, did, how, did that, how does that come about? Perfect through sacrifice? Perfect through suffering? I thought he was perfect. He is perfect. He's completely perfect. But what it's trying to say here to you and me is he is our captain who is perfect through suffering. He is someone that you and I can get behind. He is someone that you and I can really follow. Why? Because he's been through everything you and I have been through. He experienced everything that we would experience and way more so that you would never be able to say, Lord, you don't know what I'm going through. You can't say that about Jesus. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the captain that we follow. Speaking, he is number one. Listen, if you had a president of the United States that had never been to war, but he sends our troops off and he says, good luck, don't do anything that I wouldn't do, those soldiers could look back and say, we're already doing something you don't do. We're standing up for our country and we're ready to lay down our lives for the people of the United States. But if you have a president like we've had in past, many presidents that were in the army that were generals, I think of Eisenhower who fought in wars and survived, came back to become president. When he sent troops off and he said to them, good luck, I'm praying for you. Don't do anything that I wouldn't do. They could look back at him and say, we will. Because we know that you would do the same if you were in our position. And that was a president that they could get behind because they knew he would do the same thing. He would, wouldn't ask them to do anything that he wouldn't do himself. 
And that's why I say to you that Jesus Christ wouldn't ask you to do anything for him that he wouldn't be willing to do himself. So when we suffer for the name of Jesus, we're in good company with Jesus. The Bible says in Philippians to know him in the power of the resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made even conformable, even unto death. It's like, wow. You mean living for Jesus means there's going to be some tough times? Yeah. You need to die to yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. He told us that we would have tribulation in this world. He never said it was going to be easy. That's why with Satan, Satan offers you all the good stuff first and then destroys your life. You know, sin is fun. Do you know that? I know you're in church and you don't want to support that, but that's why we sin. Because it's enjoyable, it's fun, but it's only fun for a moment. See, we live in a society that wants immediate gratification, don't we? We want it, and we want it now, right? When you order your food through the drive-thru at McDonald's, you want that bag hanging out of the window when you pull up, right? You want it now, and Satan knows that, so he gives you money, he gives you power, he gives you sex, he gives you drugs, he gives you all the things you want right now, and then he takes it, and he, he gets you hooked, and then he destroys you. You know what Jesus said? He said, you know what? I'm going to give you all the crummiest stuff first. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. You're going to suffer. But lo and behold, I'll be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you strength to get through this. But I'm telling you this, I saved the best for last. That's good news. So he says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make them make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren, them brethren, saying, I declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church will sing praises unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, and the children which God hath given me. That is good news. He loves you so much. He, he, you're part of the holy family. Who are we? We're part of the holy family. We're the children of the most high. Who are we? We're the family, the royal family, chosen, set apart people. Kings and priests, he made us. We will rule alongside him in the kingdom. It is an amazing thing to think that we are of the family of God and we need to start acting like it. You know what it says? I like what it says there in verse 12. It says that when we're worshiping, he's in the midst of us singing too. Is that cool or what? So he's not only when we go to war in the battle with us, because that's the kind of captain he is, but when we're all gathered together and we're singing worship today, did you feel his presence when you were singing worship today? Man, I felt it. I don't know about you. That song, Good, Good Father, I mean, whoo, hello. We're singing Good, Good Father. Jesus is in here singing Good, Good Father right along with us. That is mind-blowing. He is in our midst constantly. He will never leave you nor forsake you. But in verse 14, it says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. So he came down clothed in flesh and blood, fully man, fully God, that through death, the death of the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. And deliver them, speaking of us, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. When Jesus paid the price on the cross and he rose from the dead, for the believer, death doesn't have a hold of us anymore, does it? Oh, death, where's thy sting? Oh, grave, where's your victory? It, it, was, it was settled. That issue was settled at the cross. For the believer. But before you became a believer, it says we were in bondage to death. We, we were all afraid of dying in some way, right? I mean, you did some things a little bit crazy and you go, whoo, that was close, I almost died. Right? And, and you see the world who doesn't know Jesus so desperately trying to prolong their life, aren't they? 
They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and I don't even want to get into some of it because it's so out there. It'd be gross to talk about. But they're trying to obtain eternal life without God. It ain't going to happen. I don't care how many blood transfusions from infants that you get. It, it's, it's not going to save your life. I don't care if you put chips in you and you start slowing down your metabolism and there's warnings of when your organs are going bad so they can make sure you live longer. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, uh, there, I, I know there's no excuses for being ugly anymore, right? We, we've got all kinds of, uh, well, you know, I'm just being real. I mean, come on. <laughs> Right? I mean, we've got all kinds of operations you can do. You can get hair plugs, guys, you know. It's like uh, there's, you know, eye work. You can get lips done, nose done. You can get your whole body changed. I mean, you can get liposuction. I mean, there, every, and you look at world, the world, and some people are consumed with it. And, and granted, you could do all those things, but you're still going to die. Yeah. Now, you're going to look better than me when you die. But you're still going to die. Who'd you put your trust in? Did you put your trust in Jesus or did you put your trust in the world? See, for Christians, how many of you don't fear death? And for anybody watching online, that was just, I think every hand went up. Nobody fears death. We just kind of fear how we die, right? (laughs) Right? I mean, make it quick, you know. But to the world, they freak out. Because I'll tell you what, I look at some of these guys that are running the world right now. It's not politicians, it's not kings, it's not presidents, it's not uh, prime ministers that are running the world. It's bankers, guys. And these rich guys are calling the shots. And you know what? They don't know Jesus. And one day, with all of their billions, they're going to be laying on their deathbed, and all the money they have, and all the power they have, and all the authority won't mean squat. And they will be kicking and screaming because they're about to be tossed into outer darkness. It's coming. But to you and me, we don't fear death. Because Jesus said, if you're born twice, you'll die once. Born once physically, born twice spiritually, die once physically, be in eternity in heaven. But if you are born once and you reject Jesus Christ, you will die physically and you will die again spiritually as you're cast into outer darkness for all eternity. Why don't you just come to Jesus and then you won't have to fear death? Verse 16, he says, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. This is a really good verse here because, once again, this book of Hebrews is something that you can use when you talk to your dear friends that are Mormons or Jehovah Witness. I love those guys. I want to win them to Jesus. I want to show them the right Jesus because they got the wrong Jesus. But this is one of those verses that you can use for verily... Speaking of Jesus, he did not take on the nature of angels. It's clearly saying, Jesus, hello, is not an angel. Isn't the word of God complete? God already anticipated everybody that would come in and twist the scriptures and start calling Jesus an angel. Even the Hebrews were lifting up angels higher than Jesus. And God comes right in and says, Jesus didn't take on the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He came as a man. To die for man. Why? Because we were made in his image. Verse 17, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. Man, you want to circle that. Highlight that thing. That's why he came. That's the whole reason. He, we serve a faithful, merciful high priest. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad the one that's running everything loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you? You are special to him? I mean, that to me is mind-blowing. He is our merciful, faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or strengthen or help them that are tempted. What does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus suffered being tempted? Does that mean that when Jesus was down here, 
fully God, fully man, that he was getting tempted like you and me, and he was struggling with it. Oh, gosh, she is a beautiful woman. I really want to sleep with her, but I can't. I'm Jesus. Do you think that's what it means when he suffered temptation? No, it didn't mean that at all. You know what that means? He was tempted not to see if he could sin, but he was tempted to prove he couldn't. I remember J. Vern McGee talked about this bridge that was built in his own hometown. They built this metal bridge, and they brought two big locomotives up on top of the bridge, and they hit the whistles, and the whole town poured out to see. And somebody said to the captain, he said, listen, are you doing that to see if the bridge will break? And the captain said, no, we're, we're, the engineer, he said, no, we're doing it to prove it won't. Jesus suffered temptation to prove that he can't sin. Okay, let me put it to you this way. You and I get tempted. We wrestle, not like Jesus, but we wrestle with temptation. We know what's right, we know what's wrong, and we're trying to do the right thing. We're trying to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior, right? So let me give you an example of, of temptation where we might buckle. So um, somebody might say to me, hey, you want to go get a, a, a burger and fries? And because I'm trying to lose weight, though I'm losing the battle, as you can see, but it, I would say, no, I don't want to go. I'm trying to lose weight. But if they set in front of me a half-pound grass-fed patty with bacon, cheese, lettuce, tomato, onion, fresh-baked, homemade bun, and steak fries seasoned in front of me, I'm probably going to buckle. I might say, you know what, I'm just going to take a bite and push it away, but I will, I will finish that whole thing. <laughs> that sounded pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> what are we having today for lunch? <laughs> but listen, if you put a bowl of sewage in front of me, poop, diarrhea, little corn in there, you know, I, you know, you know what I'm saying? Right, you'd be like that. You're like, I ain't eating that. And you will not even be tempted. Why? Because it causes you to gag. It makes you sick. You're wondering where I'm going with this, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> when Jesus was here on this earth, the temptation came to prove he couldn't. And when he was hanging on the cross, he suffered temptation looking at the sewage of the world and the evil. And that caused him to suffer what the world is tempted by and what the world succumbs to. So let me wrap this up. How do we fight against the devil? How do we fight temptation? In Matthew 4 and Luke 4, we see where Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Remember when Jesus started his ministry at 30? Uh, as soon as he was baptized by John the Baptist and the Lord said, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased, you know, listen to him. Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, 40 day fast. And, and during that 40 day fast, Satan was just pelting him, coming at him with temptations. And it's called the temptation in the wilderness. And remember, he came to him and he said, listen, you know, it's been 40 days. You know, I know, you know, since you're God, you know, if you're really hungry, you see those rocks over there? I know you could turn it into a nice, you know, hot baked loaf of bread and eat and you would be all good. Since you're God, why don't you turn these rocks into bread? And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So then he took Jesus up to the high mountains and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, you know what? All these are yours. Why? How, how can he say that? Unless it was true. You notice Jesus never disputed that. You never heard Jesus say when he said all these kingdoms are your, can be yours if you worship me. You never heard Jesus say, what are you talking about? These aren't yours to give away. No, Adam gave it away. That's why Jesus died on the cross to buy it back. And now he's going to take it back when he comes for his church. It's going to be a great time. But Satan took him up there and he said, look at all these kingdoms. You know what? You can have them. I'll just make it easy for you. Yeah, you don't got to go to the cross. Come on, you know. Just do this. Worship me. And the Lord said, get behind me, Satan. 
He said, For it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. And so then he took him to the high pinnacle, the top of the temple, on the temple mount. And he said, listen, throw yourself off of this and the angels will swoop in and they'll rescue you. They'll keep you from getting hurt. They'll minister to you. You'll make a grand entrance and everybody will think that you are really who you said you were. And it'd be awesome. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. So how does Satan come at you? Three ways. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Nothing new. It's not rocket science. He's going to come at you one of three ways. That's how he did it with Jesus. Lust of the eyes. Hey, Jesus, you super hungry? See those rocks right there? Man, you could turn that, just think of that, looking at perfect, hot, baked, fresh bread. Lust of the eyes. Hey, Jesus, you know what? You could have all these kingdoms and think about the power and the authority that you had. You'd be ruling. Lust of the flesh. Jesus, you know what? Throw yourself off the temple mount. The, the angels will come in and rescue you. And, you know, I know all these people. I know the Pharisees want to kill you. I know a lot of people don't believe you're really who you say you are. But, you know, this way you can make a grand ins- open everybody's eyes and then they'll see that you're really who you said you are. Perfect scenario. Pride of life. And how did Jesus deal with it? You know, Jesus could have just like flicked Satan away off to the Sombrero galaxy at any time. He could have just snapped his fingers and dissolved Satan right in front of him at any time. But you know why he didn't do that? Because you can't. You know what Jesus did in the wilderness? He showed you and me how we can defeat the enemy every single time. All you got to be is a spirit-filled man or woman who knows the Word of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand. If the worship team would come forward. Father, we thank you... um, just for the reminder of who you are and what you've done. And Lord, I pray that uh, your people are strengthened today by your words. We thank you how much, for how much you love us. And if there's someone here today that you don't know Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity while all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Just pray this in your heart. Lord, I believe you who you are. I get it. Forgive me of my sins. I believe you paid for my sins on the cross, and only you can. I believe you're the creator. You're not an angel, but you're the one that created all the angels and created everything that we see in the universe. I know that you're the only one that can forgive sins, so I ask for forgiveness of my sins right now. I believe you rose on the third day, and you're the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father except through you. Jesus, save me now. If you prayed that in your heart, just lift up your hand that I could keep you in prayer. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, 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 and you, and you. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a clap. Wow. Lord, we give you all the glory. You tell us that when one gives their life to you, that there's a big celebration in heaven. So we're just having a huge event right now. And Lord, just receive our worship now as we sing you praises and thanks for all you've done. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.